so we're going to jump back in tonight. Um, I, th- I think this will be a good one. But let's start with uh, this. How many of you have a sister? All right, put your hands on. How many, do I have any older brothers that have younger sisters? Okay, cool. So you're going to totally understand what I'm about to talk to you about right now. It's not the message, it's just right now. So my sister just got a new boyfriend. Okay. Now, pause real quick. When I say just got a new boy, because I'm sure she's going to find this somehow and watch this, that doesn't mean she's had a whole lot. She actually has. She's been very selective and very careful, and most of them just don't pass my test. But um, my sister has a boyfriend now. Now, my sister is a cheerleader for the Texans, and so she gets all kind of crazy, like, people that come after her. So anytime a new guy comes in her life, I'm always like, yeah, just get rid of him. It doesn't even matter. Don't even want to meet him. Just get rid of him. Well, this guy came into the scene here recently, and um, I won't say his name just to embarrass him, but Jeff came in the scene, and um, <laughs> just kidding, that is his name now, you know, so, but my dad goes to lunch with him and, call, and calls me afterwards, and my dad is, is maybe not as bad as me, but pretty close, and when my dad is raving about how great this guy is, my alarms go off, like, hey, something's really wrong. He is like, he's got all of them wrapped up. And then my mom calls and she's, she's in another state. She hadn't even met him. And she's, this guy seems awesome. I mean, this, this, and this, and this. And then, of course, my sister, and she's going on all this. I'm like, okay, fine. We're going to meet this dude. So we go to lunch. And I'm like, all right, man, tell me about yourself. Tell me all about your story. I want to know every detail, everything. And we're not going anywhere. I got plenty of time. Sit, talk. I was a little nicer. This guy, he's a gentleman, owns his own business. Grew up in Austin. Uh, there's a problem with that, but that's okay. <laughs> he was in a band. He, he was a lead singer in a country band. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'm like, okay. Played hockey in college. Uh, good looking guy, sharp guy. Looks like he could protect my sister. And so like all these things, and my sister's always hyping up about how nice he is, how genuine. And I'm like, okay, you know, maybe that's true. Maybe we'll see. And then we're having this conversation and we're at lunch and I'm trying to like stare this guy down and we're just talking. And all of a sudden he just gets up in the middle of our conversation, walks across the restaurant. I'm like, what is this dude? This dude doesn't know he's sitting with. I mean, what is this dude doing? He goes over and there's an old lady trying to get up out of her booth and he walks over and helps her to her walker. And I'm like, come on. Are you serious? I mean, is anybody tracking with me? Really? All these things? Really? This, this, this can't be real. All right, there's something. Ladies, listen, there's something. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And so I'm watching this, and I'm thinking about this, and of course, I'm like, why does she have to get up now? Like, we had to do that in front of everyone. My sister's like, got her phone out, taking pictures, she can put it on Facebook. Look, look at my man. And I'm like, this is crazy. But then I got to tell you, I started to think about it, and, uh, and, and honestly, I, I was kind of like, all right this guy's about the details, which I think is kind of cool. It's not some, he, he saved a kid back 10 years ago, and this is why he's a great man, but it's the little things that has got all of my family really just liking this guy, and he, he seems like a nice guy. I'm always careful to say he's, he's there, but he's a nice guy. It looks like it's a good thing, so kudos to my sister. Great job, but I'm watching the things, and I'm thinking about how it's these little things that are really making the impact. It's the little moments that, that have got everyone's attention to say, this guy looks like he could be a really genuine guy that could be the right person, and maybe he's the one, all right? My sister's watching, just stop. And I'm looking at this, and I'm going, you know what? Maybe, maybe I could learn a little bit from this. Because I'll tell you the truth. I'm pretty good with the big stuff. I'm pretty good at making sure the big things take care of. When, when, hopefully when you see my life, you see something that's positive, you see something that can be encouraging, knowing that I'm not perfect. But I think the big things are good. But man, sometimes the little things, they can get me. I find myself really short-tempered. I can find myself getting impatient with God. I can find all of these little things that sometimes we just brush off because they're not really a big deal. But the reality is sometimes the little things are, are just as if not even more important than the big things. And we're going to see this transpose or or play out within this story as we look at the Israelites as they continue to move through the wilderness. They've chosen the big picture to follow God and to trust him as they navigate through this. But all along the way, we keep seeing these little places that they keep tripping themselves up. They forget who they're following. They forget who God is. And I just wonder if maybe there's some of us here tonight, too, that need this encouragement because I know that I do. That sometimes the little things I'm not paying enough attention to, but they really matter. 
There's a book that a, a, a pastor in Oklahoma wrote called The Christian Atheist. It was many years ago. Maybe you've heard of it. And, and he, he writes a, a very interesting argument just saying that there's a lot of people that are, are Christians. They believe in God, yet they act like he doesn't exist. The little things, they act like he doesn't exist, but in the big picture, they, they do believe. And so he wrote this really fascinating book just kind of challenging different areas of our life that we need to think about, that we need to trust God all the way and not just in the areas. And we are gonna see that same thing right here with the people of Israel. So if you have your Bible, once you open to chapter 15, we'll navigate here quickly as we move through, but I think we're gonna find some really great and really encouraging things as we move forward. Now, a couple of background things as you're turning there. You heard it in the video, let me just remind you, so the Israelites have moved through the Red Sea. God parted it for them. He did a supernatural miracle. He parted those waters. They walked through on dry ground, and then God brought the waters back on the people of Egypt, and he completely eliminated the enemies of the Israelites forever, done, finito, it was finished. And they get to the other side and they look back on what God has done and what do they do? They begin singing. And we spent some time talking about this last week, but they break out in song and celebration and they worship God and they are celebrating because of what God has done. God has taken care of their enemies. And my wife, after our message last week, made I thought was a kind of an interesting point, but she said, it's really interesting how if you think about it, you don't hear a lot about other religions singing. Now, not to say that they don't, because there are some that do, but the reality is when you hear, when you think about Christians, singing is always connected to that. Worship in some form through music is always connected to that. I mean, we have Christian radio stations. We have now multiple, at least just here in Houston, and you don't really hear a lot of other religions with, with radio stations and things like that, and it's just Really interesting how God has not only given us that gift, but also commanded us to participate in it and to sing and to worship. And we talked last week about how amazing and freeing and how even beneficial to our health that it can be. And so here are the people of Israel and they're singing, but as the music fades away, they're gonna be faced with a whole new set of circumstances, and that's what we'll look at tonight. So let's look at chapter 15, verse 22. God makes the bitter sweet. This will be the first section for tonight. Chapter 15, verse 22. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea. So here they go. And they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, have you ever been thirsty before? Have you ever been so thirsty that you would drink Anything? Maybe not. I don't know if you've been there. But you can begin to identify when you are that thirsty, things get a little crazy. Okay? And so here are the people. They move into this wilderness. Now, immediately we got to ask a question. It's the same question we asked earlier. Moses doesn't take them down the normal trade route that most people would have taken if they were traveling. But rather, he takes them the long way through the wilderness, through the the atmosphere or the environment that would not be best for them. That would not be the safest or the healthiest, yet that's where Moses leads them, and now they've gone three days, and they are without water. Now, three days is not a terrible long time, but we do know that parts of their journey in the wilderness would not, some of you are like, uh, three hours is a long time, I get it, but in the human body, three days is not the end of the world, but... In the desert, which we do know parts of their wilderness journey would have been through the desert, three days is the longest a human can last without water. And so they are either nearing the brink, at the brink, or beginning to feel like the brink is coming, and they begin to do what? Well, they begin to do like most of us would probably do. What is gonna happen next? All right, and we understand, as humans, water, how important it is, and all of that. And by the way, it's kind of funny to think about this just for a minute. When you think about how they move through the Red Sea and they land on the other side, and now they're searching for water, yet as the Egyptians were following behind them, this is just for fun, they were looking for the Israelites, and what did they find? They found water, right? So much that it drowned them. That was just for fun. Relax. Loosen up. It's okay, right? But there is a, uh, kind of an interesting point to that, by the way. Let's just stop for a moment. And let's learn from everything. It's funny how men, women, men, humans search for things aside from God. They search, they search, they search, and sometimes they find it. They find things like wealth, or they find things like fame, or they uh, find things like career and fill in the blank, but they find so much of it that guess what? It ends up what? Drowning them. Because it wasn't the true desire that would have satisfied them. It was something that they thought they needed, so they sought it until they had too much. And typically men will fall. That was a freebie, but it'll make sense later on in the night. Verse 22. 
Then Moses made Israel set up from the Red Sea, went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness. They found no water. Verse 23, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Now listen, if you read that quickly, you miss what happened just now. They go three days without water, then they get to a new location, and it has water. This is exciting, right? Praise the Lord. We found what? Let's start singing again. Get your tambourine. Let's go. And then they get to the water, and what's wrong with the water? It's bitter. Now, we don't know if it was contaminated or dirty. I'm not going to fill in the blanks. I don't know what it was. But the reality is, for whatever reason, they couldn't drink that water. And listen, if you've gone three days without water and you find water, it's going to have to be pretty bad for you not to drink it. Okay, so we know whatever it was, this water had something that kept them from it. And so can you imagine they must, how they must have felt? How cruel it must have seemed to them, at least at first, to think that God would bring us to water that we can't drink? Why would he do this to us? This doesn't make sense. And maybe some of us can begin to think about moments in our own life where we got somewhere, we thought this was it, we thought, or the one, we're not going to go there, but we thought this was it, we thought this was the place, we thought this was the moment, we thought this was the career, we thought this was the move, we thought this was whatever, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves going, what happened? My wife and I are on the side just, just for fun, something we do is we, we like to make wedding films, we, we do videos, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll get all excited. We, we film these weddings, and then we put it all together, and we're all pumped because it's really great, and we're so excited. Then we send it over, and they respond back. They're like, here's what we want you to change. And they're like, no, it was awesome. It was great. Let's well, cut this out of tapes. So no one sees it. But it was awesome. Like, why? Why do you want to change it? No, it was great. But the reality is so often, not every time, if I could be brutally honest, but oftentimes when they ask us to do something like that, to make a change, to make an adjustment, you know what we find? We find something better. We find that actually they were right. When we put our pride aside just for a minute, we go, wow, they actually saw something we didn't see. And because we went to that place, we gained something. And so did the film. Some of you in your careers right now, you're going, man, the boss that's ahead of me, like I could totally do this better. In fact, this whole plan that we're putting together, this whole plan as an engineer that I've been doing, I don't know what y'all do, so I'm gonna stop right there so don't butcher it. But whatever this is that I'm putting together, I could totally do this better if they just get out of the way. Now you may never say that, but you're thinking it. Others of you, whatever it is, and we go, I, I, I think I could do this better. Why, why would you want to do it this way? Why not do it my way? And here's the reality. So often in life, the way we think it's supposed to go is not always the best way. You know that, but we got to be reminded. And here are the people, again, in this moment, they get to this place, they find water, and they think, this is it. And it's not what they thought it was going to be. But when we endure, look what happens, verse 24. And the people grumbled against Moses. You're going to hear this numerous times tonight. The people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And Moses cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. And there the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Okay, here's what happened. Moses is told to take a log, put the log in the water, and then that log turned the water sweet. And then God gave them a set of rules or statutes, a couple of commands to follow in obedience. Now, let's talk about this for a second. First of all, when I read this, the first thing I thought of is my daughter, Kyla, because we do this. Sit on the couch, drink your bottle that I've given you, and then don't move. That part is a struggle. Don't move. Why? Because I have some things that I need to do, but all of those things are essentially for you. So I need you to sit here and trust me and drink your little, well, she's past bottles, little cups. She tries to get a bottle, but we don't do it ever. We don't budge because we're not weak. We give her the cup, sit there, don't move, drink. You can watch a little princess show, but don't move because all the things that daddy and mommy got to do, they eventually they some way come back for you. And God essentially does the same thing. He says, listen, I'm going to bring this water to you. I'm going to make it sweet so that you can drink it. But then I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things. And I need you to be faithful so that I can finish the work that's taking place with you right now. And so often what happens is we get the goods and then we're ready to bounce. Because we got what we needed, 
So I don't need the Lord anymore, I'm moving on. Now you may not say that, but that's oftentimes how we live out our life. And so this is a normal situation, and here the people of Israel find themselves, and, and how marvelous is this picture? Think about what he says. He tells Moses to throw a log in the water. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know if you've ever done that, I haven't, but I don't think I'd have the same result. If I did, you'd be writing a book about me, right? I mean, how, how weird yet how cool is that? This water was bitter, we'll just say somehow it was contaminated, and then when Moses throws in that log, all of a sudden it's fixed. Now, for those of you that are kind of science nerds and you go, I, I, I wanna trust the miracles of God, but I also like to hear just a little bit of, like, it's, it, could, this be ha- could this be a natural thing that then God made miraculous? And I'll share with you some insight that I think is kind of fun. But always remember when we share these things, it's always the miracle of God. But it's amazing to see how God and his miraculous miracles, most of the time the miraculous comes in the timing and in the consistency. But it's amazing to see how God oftentimes, and all throughout Exodus, he's done that. He's taken that which is natural and then turned it into something supernatural. And so just for fun, listen to this for just a second. If you're not like a science buff or whatever, just... Listen anyway, because you're going to learn something really fascinating. So if the log had sap in it or on it, and he had put that log in the water, depending on the contamination of the water, what could have happened is that as the sap dropped down to the bottom of the water, it would have also brought all the contaminants down to the bottom, leaving the water that was drinkable on top. But here's what's more fascinating. The water that would have been left on top that would have been drinkable that water would have still had magnesium and calcium. And you go, well, that was, that was intense. Don't know what that means. What is that? And you're punching your neighbor. What does that mean? Here's what that means. That is two of the key ingredients found, and I'm going to read it to you so I don't butcher it up, found in uh, dolomite. Has anybody heard of this before? Love it. Okay, if not, just roll with it. So dolomite, this is really cool. Dolomite is actually an, a sports enhancer that athletes use in extreme heat. So what God would have done is not only taken the log, again, we're having fun here with science, taking the log and the sap that was in the log and brought all the contaminants down to the bottom. He would have left on top the water that would have been drinkable, fulfilling the desire and the need that they had. But then in within that water, there would have been magnesium and calcium left not only would that have been used to give them the ability to last a little bit longer in the desert heat that they're about to experience, but also those two ingredients would have helped them fight off the diseases that often would have come out of their experience in Egypt. What God did in this moment wasn't just give them water they could drink, but he now gave them tools to continue on the journey. And this is so often how God works in you and I's life that not only does he satisfy a need, but he gives us above and beyond. And it's not always in a BMW. Sometimes it's just in a sports enhancer type moment that gives you the ability to go a little bit longer. And folks, this is what we've gotta hang on to. We've gotta remember these things. It's so easy when we're sitting in a room and everything's good, you got your girlfriend next to you and you're not fighting, so you're getting ready to propose, because that'd be weird if you did that tonight, I, don't, I think I butchered it for you, I'm sorry. Everything's looking good, and, and then all of a sudden, things begin to turn upside down, or you begin to wonder, or more importantly, you just forget who God is and what he's doing in your life. Listen, we've gotta sink these things deep in our heart, because I'm telling you, and I hate to say it, but it's true, you're gonna walk out of here, and if not tonight, somewhere in the next couple days, the next week, something's gonna happen. And you're gonna to begin to wanna to question, you're gonna to begin to wonder why, you're gonna get frustrated, and when we forget who God is, we will begin to act on that, and we'll begin to pull ourselves out of line with what he has in store for us. And so we have got to remember how God not only sustains, not only satisfies, but so often he goes above and beyond. And it's very interesting when you think about uh, going back to the idea of the, the diseases that this, this particular water would have helped them fight off. Oftentimes when God was asking his people to do things, for example, uh, circumcision, to, uh, to run across with running water, to wash in running water, um, different things like that throughout the scriptures that he asked his people to do, they often had health benefits connected to them. 
And this is what's so cool is the obedience in the Old Testament in particular, the obedience that God required for his people to follow, not only was it fulfilling a moment, but it was also gaining them something extra. So often it was helping them in their health. Now, right there, we have to pause for just a moment and say this. Just because we are obedient to God doesn't mean we are never going to get sick, all right? And I'm not talking about just a cold, but I'm talking about cancer. I'm talking about all those things. Because the reality is those are much deeper and much bigger. And oftentimes, if, if you're going through something like that, I'm not going to tell you why. That's between you and the Lord, and I don't know. But I can tell you so often we see that men and women go through those kind of moments, not as punishment, but as a moment of testing, just like the Israelites are going through and this extremely long journey through the wilderness. And so when we look at all of this, we begin to look at these big pictures of God, of who he is and what he's doing. Then look at 27. Then they came to Elam where there was 12 springs of water, 70 palm trees. I love palm trees, so that right there just does even more special. And they encamped there by the what? By the water. Not only did he make the old water sweet, but then he moved them to a spot where they could sit and rest. And they rested with abundantly more. And this leads into something that I think is really important. I was very excited to share this with you tonight, and I hope that it's an encouragement. There are... All of us as Christians have been called to serve the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean a full-time vocational ministry job, but all of us as Christians have been given spiritual gifts and been called by God to serve him. It is a part of who we are as Christians. It's a part of the body of Christ. In fact, most importantly, to understand that spiritual gifts, though they can be used outside of the church and God can use different moments to bring glory, the ultimate goal of spiritual gifting is to build up the body of of Christ. And so when you and I are here with some kind of gifting as a believer and we're not using that gifting to serve the Lord, what happens is there is basically a void. There's a void where you're sitting because the gifting that God gave you is often different than the gifting of the people sitting around you. That's how we make up the church. 1 Corinthians 12 helps us to explain that using the human body as an illustration. And so when we understand that God's called us as Christians to serve, right, we have to do something with that. But there are also moments in our life when we need to take times of rest. And here's what happened with the people of Israel. In this moment of rest, if you go and scan these scriptures intensely, you can do this later, you will find that in the moments of rest, God was not really teaching them anything. God wasn't revealing himself, God wasn't showing himself, but rather he was allowing them to rest. But it was in the difficult situations as they were following him, translation maybe for us modern times, as we're serving him, it was in the most difficult moments that they learned the most. And God understands this about you and I. There's gonna be moments of serving and challenge and trial and testing, and that's the beauty of the Christian life, but then our good, merciful God knows that there are also moments that you and I need to rest. And it's important to understand, if you need to rest, you shouldn't be, if you will, thrown off the bus of the church because you're not helping. We have to understand the balance and understand that there's moments. When are times of rest? Obviously when you're exhausted, of course. But it's times when you, you lose a family member that you love and, and you're rattled by that. Those are moments to pull back and experience and to heal and to meet with God. When we go through trials, life change. Those are, Amanda, they had their baby. What happened? They're taking rest. They're not here. You gotta listen to me every week, sorry because they're taking rest, much needed rest, as life changes. And you see how this works. And so it's important that you understand that so you don't try to fight through in an unhealthy season. But at the same time, it's important that we all understand that those moments of rest are sh temporary. I won't say always short, but they're temporary because God has wired, called you and I to serve. And so sometimes what happens is people get in the rest mode and then they get complacent and they never really come back. 
And so we've got to always find the balance. I think it falls on the church to understand the balance, but it also falls on us, the believers, to work in this thing together, to stop and ask for help when we need help, to come and receive when we need to receive, but also to give when it's time to give. And here's what's so fascinating about it. It's in the times that we are moving and shaking and going through the trials that we learn the most. But in the rest, our good, gracious God allows us to do just that. This is an important moment, and it's modeled here as the Israelites come into this place, and they sit, and they rest. Then let's look at chapter 16. God provides from the heavens. This is fascinating. Chapter 16, verse 1. They set out from Elam, and all the came to the wilderness of sin. Now, let's pause right there. Sin it is not uh, any kind of connection to the sin we know about now. Now, when we look back on it, this whole moment, is full of it, but that, that's not the intention. It's just a place called sin. So I just want to be careful in case you were wondering, what does that mean? Is there some deep meaning? No, there's not. Just keep reading. <laughs> Which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month, that's about one month after leaving Egypt, after they had departed the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel, gr again, grumbled grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that, have, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full? For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Okay, now these people, they have problems. And you got to be careful before you start pointing fingers at them and, and make sure you're not pointing at yourself. Because they keep finding themselves in the same situation, not learning the same lesson that God's been trying to teach them all the way through. Now, what's happening? First of all, they're hungry. First they needed water. They found water, but it was bitter. Now, they, now God turned to sweet from. Now they're hungry. And they go, listen, where we were in Egypt, everything was better. Because we just sat and ate whatever we wanted. We had whatever we need. Now, of course, we were slaves. We worked against our will. But at least we had food. And this is exactly what the enemy does. He takes a few little good memories that you have from your past. And he makes you think it's good to go back there. And you forget. But this is why, slow, man. This is why some of you keep dating the same type of person. And you wonder why something's wrong. Because you ain't learning the lesson. <laughs> okay, 10 seconds silence is going to really sink in now. You got it? <laughs> But isn't there some reality to this? Because this is what the enemy does. He doesn't say, oh, remember when that was just a terrible situation? That person wasn't a believer. They led you astray, and that's why it didn't work out. No, he says, but they were cute, and they were nice, and all your friends thought it was cool, and they all gave you the thumbs up, so maybe you should try this again, and you keep doing the same thing over there. This goes on and off for so many different scenarios. And this is what the enemy loves to do. He loves to twist our past just a little bit, make us think it's a good thing, and he does this just for the people of Israel. How quickly they go from gratitude to complaining. Oh, the Lord has made the water that was bitter now sweet. Oh, here we are again. Now we're hungry. This Lord, he just keeps forgetting us. This Moses keeps leading us astray. I mean, come on. Why can't you get it together? And here we are, this grumbling group of people. And like I told you at the beginning, I think for me, uh, we have to be careful because sometimes we read over this stuff so quick and think, well, they're grumblers. Good thing I'm not. But then when you stop for a moment, you think, you go, oh, maybe I'm not that much different. When you think about a big ship, you can find all this in James, by the way, the book of James. When you, see, when you think about a big ship and the largest cruise ship or whatever you can think of, when it is being steered, what's it being steered by? A small little rudder. When you think about, if you think about a forest fire, we don't get many of those here in our forest, but we have had major wildfires. When you think about a wildfire, so often it comes from what? Some big massive thing? No, usually it's a small little spark. You think about some of the wildest animals that have been tamed by men, yet man can't seem to tame his tongue. When we think about this, we're reminded that these little things have so much power, but sometimes we as Christians stop worrying about the little things. And I'm telling I keep bringing this up because this was my own conviction as I was preparing this message. I'm good at the big things, but I find myself, I get so, fr I'm just being honest with you, it's a truthful moment here. Uh, we'll cut this one, take two. I get so frustrated so easily. Anybody like that? Am I the only one? You know, I can be honest. But I find myself getting so frustrated over little things that should not matter. Okay? Now we hit some big stuff, financially, we're in trouble. No big deal. God's got us. I'm not even worried about it. 
But then all of a sudden, somebody cut me off on the road, and I'm like, I, 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 I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to lose my mind. I don't even know what's wrong with that. I'm going to lose my mind. And Sarah's looking at me like, yes, you are. Like, what is, what's wrong? And it's amazing how in these big things I have found rest and peace in God. But because I've gotten lax, some of these little areas have been destroyed. I find something, I would say it's destructive. And then I'm reminded of how even with like a big ship, it's controlled by what a small little rudder. And so when we think about the little things and we brush them off like no big deal, we forget how the little things eventually lead to the big things. And here are the people forgetting. They've chosen to follow God. They trust him. They're forgetting that he's faithful all the way through. Even when we hit a little stack of but being honest in ministry. So part of the, the like getting frustrated, it's so overwhelming because there's there's so many people like all of you guys, we love you, I love you, and there's so but there's so many classes and so many ministries, and so people are always coming up and asking for advice and things like that. And I'd love to do that. It's so great, but some of that's overwhelming. You know this if you, if you are the if you're the believer at work or at school, if you're a believer at work though, people always come to you in their times of trouble, right? Why? You ever thought about that? And you catch yourself and like, man, if one more person comes up to me, I, I just don't even know what I'm going to do. I'm not going to get my job. done. Here's what's happening. They see you, and they see light. They see hope. Now, they pick on you when things are okay in their life because they're not worried about it. But as soon as things go down, you're the one they run to. And it can be overwhelming when you forget why you've been placed there. But then when you are reminded that it's not, yes, it's a little overwhelming, but it's the honor that they would trust you enough. That in their darkest moments to turn to you. And my point is, man, these little things, when we don't harness them, when we don't grab hold of them, we don't get, get control of them, and, and remember that these little things can affect the big things. For, for a guy like me doing ministry, it's easy to let some of the little things interfere, and all of a sudden your ministry begins to move off path. It's the same thing in your life. Whatever the little things are for you, we've got to grab them. And here are the people of Israel, they don't seem to get little things. They keep forgetting, they keep forgetting. And here we go again. Then look at Exodus 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, here's what I'm about to do. I added that. Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. Ever seen that before? And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared. I jumped to verse 10, by the way. The glory appeared in a cloud. The glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat. God's going to bring quail. And in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. God appears to them when he should have been aggressive and angry and frustrated because these people are getting old. They keep saying the same thing. They keep forgetting who I am. I'm speaking for God. They keep forgetting, but he doesn't do that. He comes with what? Grace and mercy. And he says, listen, okay, I don't know why you guys aren't believing me, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let bread, a bread come from heaven. It's going to fall down. It's going to land, essentially, if you'll symbolically, in your lap. And I'm going to provide for you. And immediately we get this thought that oftentimes when God provides for us, it's not always how we thought it would be. Right? Have you ever seen that before? I was at Starbucks the other day. I only go there twice a day. Um, I'm totally <laughs> kidding. I'm totally kidding. But I was at Starbucks and I have my debit cards broken. It's cracked. And so I try not to use it so that it'll last. Right? Because, you know, this makes sense. That's a guy thing. And so I got, I got it taped up, whatever. But I, I didn't want to use it, so I was trying to get cast. And so I get to the window and, of course, I was listening to music one band and I get to the window and the guy's like, hey, you owe. And uh, he actually didn't say that because as I'm pulling in my wallet trying to get out of the cast and I'm fumbling around, the guy goes, hey, don't worry about it. The person in front of you paid for your dream. And I was like, that's so, man, that's so cool. Thank you so much. And so I got my drink and I drove off. And I get down the, I get down the road and, and then I'm reminded that, no, this is just for fun. I probably broke the chain of 50 cars that had been doing that. Right? Now, that's not the point. But I, I'm like, I look back on that and I go, man, I wish I had thought about that because I could have been a part of the solution, not the problem. But the reality is, isn't it amazing, though, in moments like that, when you, you didn't expect it, and yet God delivered. Stocky, one of the missionaries that serves out of our, out of our church and out of our ministry here at Underground, uh, they've been, they were praying for a car, praying for a car, praying for a car. They're ministry-driven, so they don't have a whole lot of money, so they have to work real carefully and diligently with what they have. Man, someone, I think it was a Suburban or a Tahoe, like, it is cool. Just, here you go. Keep doing what the Lord's doing. No idea. 
at the time didn't know where it came from. He found that out. But how cool that the Lord brought. It wasn't how they thought it was going to come. That they're going to pull some funds together. make it happen. But how the Lord was faithful and provided just when they needed it. And so just like this, the bread fall from heaven. That's not normal. That's not how it normally happens. But God provides even in the ways that don't make any sense yet. That's how he works. And he provides more than enough. But it also, notice this is really important. It says that they're going to have to gather their portions. And this is big, young people. All right? I'm young too. This is big. Because even though God provides, they still had to work. God didn't drop the food in their mouth for them. He said, I'm going to bring it, but you're going to go gather it. And so many people, and I'm not going to say you, but it could be, we live our life as if uh, we're just waiting for God to make everything happen. We're kind of sitting there playing video games. No, I don't, I'm not against video games. Don't forget about that. <laughs> but the symbolic thing, you're just playing video games. Instead of getting out there and starting to move and then letting God navigate. So we use a park car illustration here all the time. If you try to steer a parked car, what happens? Just the wheels turn. But man, when you start moving that car just a little bit and you begin to steer, all of a sudden that car's got a chance to move in different directions. And we can use that symbolically in how God might work in your life. That as you begin to move forward, you begin to seek that degree, you begin to seek that career, you begin to seek the Lord and you're moving, then all of a sudden he comes in and he's be able to navigate you where he desires for you to go. He dropped it for them, but he didn't just put it in their mouth. They had to go gather. They had to work just a little bit. And then 17, last little part. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Here we go again with the water. Therefore, the people did what? Trusted God because he was faithful before. He'll be faithful again. No, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? Didn't you learn the first time? I added that. But the people thirsted there for water and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Is this not like a movie that never ends? It makes no sense. When are we going to learn, people? Learn, learn. God is faithful. It doesn't always look the way we want it to, but God is faithful. And so here we go again. The people are quarreling and quarreling and quarreling. Then verse 4. And Moses cried to the Lord. What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, gather the leaders. And take in your hand the staff which you will, which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on a rock at the Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the rock and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so. In the sight of the elders of Israel, he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Two things I want to point out really quick that is so important. First, Moses cried out. Translation, Moses prayed to God. Sometimes the prayer is not just on your knees, hands closed, Lord, please. Sometimes it's cry. And Moses went before the Lord. And that's one of the qualities about Moses that has been so faithful throughout. He whined a lot when he went to the Lord, but he always went to the Lord. And Moses stood before the Lord for his people. And listen, if you are, uh, if you happen to be a leader in this room, a small group leader, a teacher, whatever, let me tell you, this should convict us every time. Because as leaders, whatever it is you're leading, we should always be pleading on behalf of our people. We should always be pleading on behalf of our people. Why? Because when we plead on behalf of our people, not only does it honor God, but it gives us the eyes of the Lord to see the things the way he sees. When God's people, when God's leaders stop praying, they forget what they're doing and why they're doing it. And then they get complacent. And then it gets dangerous. And Moses was so faithful with this. Again, he wasn't always perfect, but he was so faithful. And he stood before God and he said, God, here are my people. What do I do? And by the way, this is free, but I want to say this to you. Ladies, um, if, you, if you are wanting to find a quality in a man that you could put above the rest, here's what I would tell you. Look for a man that prays all the time, not just when he needs to. A lot of us are good at going before the Lord when we need something. 
But a true man or woman of God goes before the Lord always, even when he doesn't need anything, simply for gratitude. That's the life of all of us. Moses modeled that. And I'm telling you, when we pray, this isn't about prayer, but Moses said, when we pray, there's something that happens. Sometimes we get to be a part of intervening and changing things, but so often what happens is God just brings us in the storm. Because we stopped for a moment and stopped trying to figure it all out ourselves, we were able to see what God saw, see what God sees, and he lets us in the storm. You want a man or a woman that you can be proud to stand next to? You find someone that prays all the time, not every minute of the airport, but that is always praying. It doesn't just call on God when they need him. You go to a restaurant. If you've ever asked, some, some of you may do this, if you, you sit down and you're about to pray, oftentimes, if you want, it's a good thing to ask the waiter, like, hey, is there anything I can pray for you for? Is there anything going on? I don't want to embarrass you. You don't have to pray. I just want to know if there's something I can pray for you. Try that. It's a really cool thing. Try that start when y'all go out to, like, old Chicago, wherever y'all go. But many times, you know what they'll tell you? No, I'm good. I'm, I'm okay. And all that means is either they may not be a believer, so they may not be interested in all that, but if they are a believer, it usually means that their prayer life is simply when they need something. The difference between a man and a woman of God that truly is above the rest, not in quality or stuff, but is seeking the Lord in a way that others are not, is someone that prays all the time, not just when they're in need. Don't forget that. That's very, very powerful. And how Moses modeled this for us is so powerful. And then the, the second thing I just want to show you is the staff. As soon as God said, take that staff, I don't know if you did, but I know Moses thought about all the things that have happened with that staff. All the things that God has already done and how that staff, not to take it too far out of its concept, but has been a symbol for him of all the ways God has been faithful, all the things, the, the Nile into blood, the water parting, it turned into a steak, all the things that God has done with just that staff was a reminder to Moses every time he picked it up. And even in these moments when God said, I want you to take that staff, that God had been faithful, God is faithful, and God will remain faithful. Faithful. And I just wonder if some of us symbolically have some kind of something like that in our lives. Some staff, some moment, some situation where you go, man, God got me through that, and he got me through that. I'm really not worried about anything. I just wonder, and if you don't, maybe think about that. Ask the Lord, show me something, remind me of a time. Because when we have something like that, man, it drives us to live differently. And then he says, I want you to take that staff, and I want you to strike the rock, and an anomaly happens. Water comes out of the rock. Now, I don't know about you. have never done this. I've never seen it happen before. I don't think it ever will. This is a miracle of God. That as Moses struck that rock, the water came out. And what a picture it must have been. They didn't need another picture because they had so many already. But yet here God was faithful and gracious with mercy again to show them. And then it says that they named the place. And in the Old Testament, almost every time when they name a place, it's because that's where they encountered God. Do you know why they named it? Because in the Old Testament, there were very few people that actually had an encounter with God, unlike us today, who have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And so, so often they would name it, it would be a monument where they would always remember the time that God spoke, or God was standing there, or God was with them. And why did this moment happen? Because they asked the question, is God even among us? Is God even here? Maybe you've asked that. Okay, it was great for 10 years, but here I am today with this situation, with this challenge, with cancer, whatever it is. Is God really here, or were those some good stories when I was growing up in church? Is he really here? And here's what they saw. God was there, standing on the rock. He was actually there. They got to see him, but he also was there providing. By the way, this is why we say God, and when God says, tell him that I am sent you. That's why we sing great I am. Why? Because God is all of it. God has been there from the beginning. God has all power, all of creation it comes by him and worships him when they are falling correctly. And at the end, he will provide everything all the way through. He is everything that you could need now, and he's anything you will need in the future. This is why we say he is the great I am. He is everything. He is. He doesn't become. He always was. And that's why we sing that. And this is the moment that they're having. This is the moment they're experiencing when they finally look up and see this God is. He's here and he provided just as he has every time. Watch this. When the manna came from heaven, it came from the sky. What does that give you the picture of? Where did Jesus come from? He came from heaven. It's an early symbol of the coming 
of Jesus Christ. John 6 says, Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. He's not talking about food. He's talking about spiritual fulfillment. The deepest desire of every human is to be reunited with God. Whether they know it or believe it or not, the deepest desire, the deepest fulfillment of every human is to be reunited with God Almighty. And here is Jesus, the picture, what a picture the bread coming from heaven, the symbol that Jesus is going to come to. But then the rock, you can't forget the rock, right? Moses struck the rock and what came out of it? Water. 1 Corinthians 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, talking about the people of Israel, and all passed through the sea, the Red Sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was who? Christ. Do you remember when Christ was on the cross, when he died? They poked him. What came out? Blood and picture symbolism. John 7, 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Finally, when Moses threw that log into the water was the last picture of what Jesus would do. When Jesus comes on the scene, the log, by the way, represents the wood. The wood of what? The wood of the cross that Jesus would hang on for you and I. And then when Jesus comes on the scene, when Jesus died and rose again and we accept him into our life, what happens? The life that was once bitter now becomes sweet. And this is the power of God, the symbolism all the way back in the Old Testament leading to us now. It is every man's, every woman's deepest desire to be fulfilled, to be reunited with God, whether they believe it or not. And from that moment, from the cross, we don't obey God to get to the cross, but we obey because of our response to what Jesus did for us on the cross. Abraham Lincoln, many, many, many years ago, did something absolutely marvelous. He was coming to a slave auction and saw a young girl on a block to be sold. He had pity on that girl and he bought her. When he bought her, he brought her to her and he said, young lady, you are free. And she looked at him with tears running down her eyes and she said, what does that mean? And he says, my dear, it means that you are free. She said, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. Does that mean that I can do whatever I want? He said, yes, my dear, you can do whatever you want. Does that mean I can say whatever I want to say? He said, my dear, you can say whatever you want to say. She said, can I be whatever I want to be? He said, yes, my dear, you can be whatever you want to be. You are free. And then finally she asked, can I go wherever I want to go? And he said, yes, you are free. You can now go wherever you want to go. And with tears now pouring down her face, she looked at Abraham Lincoln and she said, then I will go with you. Listen. When you and I understand what God truly did for us on the cross through Jesus Christ, and when we accept it, we won't feel like we have to follow him. We will want to. And that is our desire. Don't get caught up in not worrying about the small things that we miss the moments all around us that God is working. No matter how tough it may be right now, it's not always the big things. I feel like we always talk about the big things. Sometimes it's just the little things. But in the little things too, God is working. God provides. God always has been. God always will be. Whatever you need now, he is it. Whatever you will need in the future, he will be at too. He is the great I am. He gives all we need, and in him is all we need to put our hope.